What's up, everybody? Welcome. My name is Mike Doctor. Thank you again for joining. Um, we are reading Pound the Stone by Joshua Metcalf. I am one of, well, I am the coach of one of the house basketball teams, uh, the high school basketball team out of um, Skeegan, Michigan, playing with the Michigan Basketball Academy. We got our season coming up. We've started our practices, our first tournaments, May 4 of 2024, and we're stoked for that. And every year we read a book. And this year, the book is Pound the Stone by Joshua Metcalf. As I mentioned before, uh, if you're just stumbling upon this video for the first time, I would uh, recommend if you like it, you go back and look at the House Chopwood Carry Water playlist uh, for the first book in the series, Chopwood Carry Water, which is the book our team read last year. Um, so uh, this is uh, Pound the Stone, Chapter 7 and Chapter 8 with some thoughts today. So Chapter 7, Defining Success. Jason knew this job wasn't going to be easy, so he wasn't surprised when the first few doors he knocked on didn't lead to sales. But just before lunch, he stopped at a children's learning center. After his pitch, he was, he was expecting the usual. Sorry, we're not interested. But instead, the woman just smiled as she looked the books over. We'll take five of each. Jason couldn't believe it. After getting the paperwork signed, he walked down the street with a huge smile. He just sold 30 books. That energy must have been contagious because later that afternoon he sold 25 more to a community library. He felt so good about it that he even punched out early. 55 books was a solid day's work and at this rate he'd be able to hit his target of 1,200 books early. Dinner that night was big, a big delicious spread of home cooking that made Jason's mouth water. After Russ said grace, he dug in. As he did, Jan looked up from her plate. So Jason, what are you grateful for today? Jason grinned. Well, I made my first two sales today, 55 bucks. Russ nodded. That must have felt good. <clears throat> it did. So I guess you could say I'm grateful that on my first day, that my first day was a success. Jan glanced at Russ, who smiled. Success. That's an interesting little word. How so? Well, it means very different things depending on who you ask. I guess it depends on how you define success. How do you define success, Jason? Russ's eyes were glued to Jason. Uh, I don't know. Jason realized that he hadn't thought about this much. I guess I would say achieving your goals, making enough money to do what you want, and not having to struggle. By the disappointed look on Russ's face, Jason wondered if he had somehow said something wrong. Before he could ask, Jan jumped in, empathetic. That is definitely one way to define it. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Dave that might help you understand the importance of defining success well. You see, Dave was a musician, and when he was a few years older than you, his band was about to record their first major album. They had flown to New York City and were just days away from recording when the other members of the band decided they no longer wanted Dave in the band. Jason's head shot up. Man, if that happened to me, I'd be furious. I can only imagine what it would have done. J what you would have done, Jan chuckled, glancing at his cast. So on the bus ride back to Los Angeles, Dave decided that he was going to start a, a new band, and he, and he determined what success would look like for his band in his life. Success would be making more money, getting more girls, selling more albums, and being more famous than the other guys. He decided to recycle his pain and use it to fuel his training and mastery. Jason nodded, curious. So what happened? Over the next 10 years, his band started to sell a lot of albums eventually eclipsing more than 15 million in sales as they toured across the world. And many people consider Dave Mustaine and his band Megadeth to be one of the pioneer legends of hard rock and roll. Jason's eyes went wide. Wow, I mean, hard rock's not really my style, but I know those guys. That's a really cool story. Oh, but the story doesn't end there. Remember, this is about the importance of how you define success. A few years ago, Dave broke down in tears in an interview and admitted that he still didn't see himself, or excuse me, Dave broke down in tears in an interview and admitted that he still sees himself as a failure. Jason couldn't believe it. What? How in the world could he believe that? Because the band he got kicked out of was Metallica, Jan replied. Jason's mouth dropped open in shock as she continued. Because David defined success as being bigger and better than Metallica, he was never able to see his band as successful. No matter how many albums they sold or tours they booked, it's a dangerous lesson. If you aren't careful, Jason, you can end up defining success using metrics that aren't really valuable and ending up with a version of success that, like Dave, actually feels more like failure. Instead, it might be more helpful to think about it this way. 
How will you define success on your deathbed? Typically, people say three things that really mattered were who they were, who they became as a person, the impact that they had on others, and whether they lived a life that they knew, uh, and whether they lived a life they knew were, they were supposed to live. Russ and I can tell you, can't tell you how to define success for yourself, but that is something you should definitely think about. Russ cleared his throat. One of my favorite quotes is from a guy named Francis Chan, who said, Our greatest fear in life should not be failure, but of succeeding at things in life that don't really matter. Every day people head out the door believing that everything will be different if they can just achieve more, win more, or make more money. But if achievement hasn't filled that void yet, how is achievement going to fill that void in the future? Like thirsty people guzzling salt water, achievement only creates a greater desire for accomplishing more, dehydrating us of true satisfaction and fulfillment. One of my greatest fears has always been getting to the end of my life and, and the top of the ladder and realizing that my ladder has been on the wrong building all along. You want to make sure your ladder is on the right building, Jason. Jason nodded, lost in thought. As he finished his dinner, he, he stood up to walk back to the guest room. Excuse me, Jan smiled and looked at Jason. He paused, confused. Pull your weight, remember? You can clear the table and dry the dishes since you have a cast. Oh, I'm sorry. I was still thinking about the story and I completely forgot, he nodded and went to work. As he crawled into bed that night, Jason thought it over. The story Jan had told was powerful, but he couldn't help but wonder if that was how she and Russ rationalized their place in this world. They drove the worst car on the block and had the smallest house. The people Jason looked up to drove cool cars, got lots of girls, and made tons of money. Jason was grateful for Russ and Jan's help, but when they when push came to shove, he wasn't he was going to trust the definition of success that actually came from someone successful, not from this couple. All right, so I stumbled over my words there, and I apologize for that. But I want to talk about a few different things. Look, we live in West Michigan, and West Michigan is pretty privileged, right? We don't know what it's like to have a hard life. Most of us don't know what it's like to have a hard life. If you're playing on this team, your family had at least $1,000 to spend on you playing on this team. That is a lot of money. I don't care who you are. That is a significant amount of money for you to go and play a game, right? Uh, and, and come to these practices and do everything else. It's one of the reasons why being grateful is so important. But because we're so privileged, we often think of success as having cool things or having an, an incredibly awesome career or making a lot of money or being able to go on trips and all this other stuff. And there's nothing wrong with any of that. Trust me, I do all those things. I love all those things. I love to travel. I love to invest in experiences. I love having you know nice things. We have a nice vehicle. We have a beautiful home. We have dogs, we have pets, we have all kinds of ridiculous stuff, right? But at the end of the day, what is success? If those are the things that you define in your head as value and successful, anytime those things are taken away from you, your entire identity will also be stripped of you. I know this from experience. I've failed at multiple different things. Uh, most recently, um, I was a failure in business. Um, and when COVID hit, the business that I was running went straight into the grounds and led to bankruptcy. And I put all of my value and all of my identity in being successful at that one thing about being sought after to go and speak and teach and do all these other things that I was doing uh, to have people reaching out to me to have me consult on different stuff. I put all of my value as a human being in that one thing. And that was my definition of success is being looked at as as this this. Uh, awesome, cool guy who, who achieved all these great things, right? And when that got taken away from me, I sunk into an extraordinarily dark place. And it completely tore me apart. And thankfully, I have an amazing wife and an amazing family who didn't give up on me, even though it was pretty bad. And um, moving through that, I realized that, that that's not success. And my definition of success needed to change. And so I would encourage you as you're defining success for yourself to think about what are the things that really matter? At the end of your life, what is it that you're really going to care about? Is it going to be about how many baskets you scored in that one game? Probably not. 
Is it going to be about winning those trophies? Probably not. Is it going to be about, oh, the house team did this? Probably not. You're probably not even going to remember the crazy dude who made a bunch of videos about a book you're never going to read again. All right. So your def definition of success is going to be something completely different. And, and I would just encourage you to not put all of your value into winning and or losing. Because if you do, when you lose, your, your identity is going to be shaken to its core. And it's going to bring in a lot of, of challenging, um, a lot of challenging things. And so I would strongly encourage you to not look at that. Uh, and I would strongly encourage you to try and find and put your value and identity in something that can't be taken away from you. And we can talk about that in another video sometime. So that was chapter seven, long explanation. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope that helped. Uh, we're going to go on to chapter eight right now. Cut the ropes. One night as Jason was returning from the day's work and gleaming blacked out, or excuse me, huh, we're going to start that over. I'm not going to start the whole video over just because I screwed up that one sentence, but I will start the sentence over. One night, as Jason was returning from the day's work, a gleaming blacked out Porsche 911 zoomed past him, pulling into the driveway a few doors down. The driver was in his 30s and looked like a Brad Pitt, tan, blonde, blonde haired, and wearing a custom fitted three piece suit that looked like a million bucks. He waved at Russ and went inside, and Jason shook his head in awe. Who is that? He asked Russ. Our neighbor, Andrew. He's a great guy. What does he do for a living? He's an investment banker at one of the big firms downtown. Russ noticed Jason's face fall a little bit as he sighed. What's wrong? You look like I just told you Santa Claus isn't real. It's nothing. Just, I know that guys like me don't get jobs like that. Are you sure about that? Yeah, pretty sure. Russ got an intense look in his eyes. Sounds like you have a rope to cut. What? What, what, is a, what does a rope have to do with being a stockbroker? Everything. A man once took his children into a zoo in India while on vacation. Their last stop was at the zoo's prized animals, the elephants. The massive beast roamed around freely with nothing but a single rope tied to a stick carried by one of the zookeepers to hold them back. The man's face went white and he grabbed the kids and backed away. He shouted at the zookeeper, Are you insane? You have two-ton beasts just roaming around here tied down by a single rope? They could snap at any time and crush everything in their path. The zookeeper just smiled. Sir, please calm down. I know how powerful they are. But what you don't know is that when they're born, the very first thing we do is tie a rope around their leg. We tie a rope to the other, we tie the other end of the rope to a strong tree. And when they are young, the rope is much stronger than them. They fight and fight to break free from the rope, but eventually their will breaks. And they come to believe that they can never break free from the rope. As they grow older, they do so with the belief that the rope has the power over them even though they have massive potential and are amazingly powerful. They will never hurt us. Their belief about the rope holds them back. Jason nodded. I think I see what you're getting at. I hope so, Jason. The question you always have to ask yourself is, what are the ropes in my life that have been holding me back? What beliefs am I clinging to that are keeping me stuck? A wise friend of mine once told me, we learn our belief systems as very little children. And and then move through life creating experiences that match our beliefs. I'm gonna read that again. We, we learn our belief systems as very little, ch little children and then move through life creating experiences that match our beliefs. Jason took a deep breath as he was deeply moved by this idea. Jason, most people are completely unaware of this. They just float down the stream through life. You must always ask yourself, what are the beliefs that may have been true at one point in my life, but are no longer true and are keeping me from fulfilling my greatest potential. Maybe it's something as simple as thinking guys like you can't become stockbrokers like Andrew, but you'd be very wrong there. Do you know who Chris Gardner is? His name sounds familiar, and it should. He's the man whose journey as a homeless single dad was made into a film, The Pursuit of Happiness. He worked his way out of total poverty to become an incredibly successful stockbroker and had a long and very prosperous career. Jason nodded. Wow, I didn't know that. Jason, it's easy to look around the world and say little things like, guys like me don't get jobs like that. But it's just not true. Whenever you find yourself thinking that, ask yourself, who says? You aren't smart enough. Who says? You need another degree to be successful in this economy. Who says? You are too old. Who says? You are too young. Who says you don't have enough experience? Who says you can never play for that team or in that league? Who says 
These false beliefs are all around us, and many times we don't even know what they are until they are broken. So we must continue, continuously ask, who says? And we must continually re-examine our beliefs to see if they are true, or if they are just a rope that needs to be cut. The more Jason thought about this, his own beliefs, the more Jason thought about his own beliefs about himself and the world, the more it made sense. Yeah, I think I might have a few of those. Well, now you know what to do with them, Russ smiled. Cut the ropes. So that's the end of chapter eight. I'm going to read that one section of chapter eight again, and I want to talk about it. We learn our belief systems as very little children and then move through life creating experiences that match our beliefs. One of the things that really, really sucks about our education system, and I'm a college professor, by the way, one of the things that really sucks about our education system is that it is framed in a way that tells you if you don't do this or you don't do that, you don't have a chance at being successful. And that's reinforced into us as little children. And it's just simply not true. Um, I'm not telling you not to go to college. I think you should go to college. Uh, but I don't think you should go to college because college is going to make you successful. What I would encourage you to do instead is think about what can happen in college and why would you want to go there and what can you get from that experience that will help you learn and grow into a better person and the best version of yourself to be able to take on the challenges that come next in your career. There is nothing in a college textbook that Uncle Google doesn't know. And with the advancement of AI and ChatGPT and all these other things, um, there is nothing that you're going to be able to do in an office job that you can't just ask ChatGPT to make for you, okay? But understanding and going through the challenges and struggles of grinding through and learning something and learning how to learn, that's what's valuable. Making connections and networking, that's what's valuable. Um, but our belief system, you can't do this if you don't do this. You're not good enough. You're a B team player. You got cut. You're not a starter. All that stuff is bullshit. Excuse me. Sorry. I probably shouldn't say that on a <laughs> video for high schoolers. Um, all that stuff is crap. All right. And, and I'm passionate about this because it's true. The only thing that's holding you back is you. If you don't believe that you're capable of doing something, You've already lost. The first thing is the belief that you can do it and that you belong in the conversation. And if you can get past all the other nonsense and all the other noise that everybody else has said about you and understand that you are here for a reason, I chose all of you specifically, by the way, to be on this team. You are here for a reason, okay? And I am here to help you understand that you are much more valuable than what everybody else says about you. And you are, your potential is much higher than what anybody else has given you credit for. And the only person who can really, truly execute on that potential is you. I can't do it for you. It's you. And it starts up here. It starts with what you believe about yourself, what you believe about the rope that's been told to you, about what holds you back. Okay? What is the rope in your life that's holding you back? You're the elephant. You are the elephant. You are strong and you are intelligent and you are worth it. Much more so than anybody else has ever told you. And there's one rope in your life that's holding you back from being that person, from, from rising to that potential. Cut that rope. Go do the things. Go take the shot. Go execute on the move. Go as hard as you possibly can in practice and in the game. I don't care who's coming up against us. They need to worry about us. We don't need to worry about them. There is no rope that's attached to us that's going to stop us from developing and working and pushing to our highest potential to give everybody else heck once we're out on that court. All right? There was my soapbox. Those were those two chapters. Chop wood, carry water. We'll see you next time, friends. Bye now.